Now tell us about the first computers you got to work with. Well, the first computers I got to work with, very hard to say because I never got to work with computers. I, um, we didn't have them even when I was in high school. I built, sure, I built my own uh, computer projects, adder subtractors with tons of transistors and diodes. I won an award in eighth grade, actually. Um, I was one of those real sharp kids. I was smart in all the school subjects, and I was smart in electronics. And combine, you know, cap mathematics with electronics, and you get engineering. And I won an award for the best, best project in the Bay Area Science Fair in electronics, and I was only in eighth grade, and they were judging me up to 12th graders. Oh, wow. So I was really advanced. Had my ham radio license in sixth grade, and I was doing all the tube stuff bit where you solder every piece together to build your ham radio transmitter, your ham radio receiver, and tune the dials and your antennas on the roof. And uh, just, you know, so all this stuff was almost natural, but it actually extended out over period of, say, 15 years of learning. I mean, it was, I had a long, long, long time to learn it all. Uh, computers, I, although I fell in love with computers, I was too shy to ever go out and explore. What do you do? How do you build a computer? Where is a book? I want to learn about computers. So whenever I stumbled onto a manual or a book or something that mentioned computers, I just read it and drooled over it and started making diagrams on paper to try to see how these sort of things were done. And in high school, I discovered um, we didn't have computer in our high school. My electronics teacher said, uh, most of the teachers say that education is in our school. What we have in the class, what we have in the school, that's what you get. Well, this teacher went outside, like a few teachers do, and got me to go down once a week to program a computer at Sylvania in Sunnyvale. And I would go down and write these programs, and I just, it was just so much fun. The one thing I thought was a computer can do a million things a second. And humans could never, ever do that sort of thing. My gosh, what power I have in my hands. And I wrote a program to jump a knight around a chessboard and hit every square exactly once. And the program never finished, and I learned about loops. And I came back, and I printed out the chessboards as it played, and I found out it was doing exactly the right thing to solve the problem, but it was going to take 10 to the 25th years, which is longer than the universe has existed. So I, I learned that day that, you know what? Speed of a computer doesn't make the whole difference. You need smart approaches to, to solving these problems. Now, I didn't have a computer of my own, but I discovered a manual down at Sylvania called the Small Computer Handbook. It described the architecture of a computer. The architecture is like the architecture of a house. Say you had a diagram that described where the rooms were, where the doors were, where the cabinets were, and all this, and then you have all of the lumber pieces, and you know how to put them together very well and saw them into the right shapes, you could build a house out of lumber. Well, to me, the architecture of a computer described the, the computer basically, and then I knew the chips and the parts that made it, the logic gates from my science fair project. So I started sitting down on paper, all alone, in my room, not with my father, not with friends, not with teachers, nobody else knew what this was. I just loved to figure out how do you put these together to design a computer. So it was totally self-taught, no books or anything. And I tried it once and it took many pages and it wasn't complete and wasn't going to work. And I got an idea later on and some better chips came out. And my father kept supplying me the better chip manuals as the, the chip companies developed better and better parts. And then I sat down and tried to design the computer again. And I got one designed, I thought, pretty completely. And then I learned how to get manuals for all the computers. I would go down to Stanford Linear Accelerator Center because a lot of smart people work there. They always leave doors open. So I'd get into the library. <laughs> I would get into the library on Sundays and I would read computer magazines and I could order ma manuals for computers. So I would order manuals for Hewlett Packard computers, Varian computers, all these different models of computers, digital equipment, data general. And when the manuals came, eventually I would sit down one day and look at the architecture of the computer and use my chip ability, which was getting better and better, to combine the chips together that would make that computer. Now, after I got bored, this is going through my senior year of high school, I'm getting bored with nothing to do any weekend, I'll sit down and try to redesign the same computer with fewer parts. I made up the game. It was a challenge with myself. So I was competing with myself, and that's where I really honed my skills and got so good at it that eventually I was designing computers with half as many chips as you'd buy them with. And tell us about the cream soda computer. The cream soda computer came um, after my second year of college. I took off for a year to earn money for my third year of college at Berkeley. And while I was working, one of the executives got me the chips. I could never afford any chips. They were so expensive. He got a company to give me the chips to build a computer of my own design. So I designed a very small, minimal-type computer, built it on a small board with switches and lights. And you know how computers always in the old days had tons and tons of lights and switches flickering around, and it just looks like gobbledygook. Who could understand that? Who in the world? Only a computer person could go near that machinery. And so, and I built one of those things. It looked like an airplane cockpit, and it actually worked and got publicity in a little newspaper, and that was uh, in between college years. And, um, and so, it, and it was, uh, and it had a little bit of RAM on it, so I could actually toggle the switches to set some ones and zeros and punch them into memory where I wanted them in memory. I put in the ones and zeros, and then I said, run the program 
and it would run a little program that might multiply a couple of switches times each other, do something, you know, kind of useless. But, uh, you know, and that's uh, a lot of people were going to do that five years later. This was 1970. Now, how did you make the, the giant leap uh, towards uh, what eventually became the Apple I? Okay, the Apple I. Um, well, first of all, I was very, very lucky. Um, some products, uh, just some consumer electronics products, just revolutionized the world. They never existed before. One of those was the first Hewlett Packard scientific calculator, the HP 35. And I just loved this machine because from, I was the high school, um, you know, um, slide rule whiz at all chemistry and anything else I could calculate. Engineering involves more calculations than anything you could imagine. So here it was, a calculator. You can punch in the numbers and see the numbers in a display. No engineer ever had a machine like that that could do sines, cosines, tangents. And by luck, I got interviewed at that division after my third year of college. I had taken off another year to work to earn the money for my fourth year of college. I got interviewed and I got a job designing calculators without a college degree, this high prestige product. And it's just basically because I was such a good designer. And um, so I'm sitting there designing them, but while I'm designing calculators for a few years, I'm doing all the interesting projects on the side, the technologies that are evolving. And one of the important ones was video games. Walked into a bowling alley and there's a pong game little ball going bing, 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 bouncing back and forth. And I looked at it, and after being mesmerized for about 15 minutes, I said, I could build one of those. I understand television signals, and I know how to design things with digital logic, because I did all my life. And I actually designed and built one, used chips at Hewlett Packard, built it in my, my um, cubicle. Hewlett Packard had a policy. You could build anything of your own design and have the parts from the stockroom if your manager approved. So I was building these projects with, with the, the HP chips, and my Pong worked, you know, and Atari wanted to hire me. I said, no way, I'm an engineer for life. Hewlett Packard's my company for life. I love them. They came from engineers, they believe in engineers, and that's all I want to be in life. I just want to design things as well as I can forever and ever. And um, eventually that led into spotting somebody on the ARPANET, a new network that connected computers around the country. There were only about eight or ten computers so far on the network, and I went to this guy's basement and he's typing on a teletype machine, an ugly old clunky thing, but it has typewriter keys. And he's typing, he says, I'm playing chess with a computer in Boston. Every time I heard the word far away, I thought, oh my God, how intriguing that you can actually reach distance. We did it with ham radio. Steve Jobs and I did it with blue boxes to make free calls in college. And now this guy is on a network connecting computers far away. And I said, oh my God, I have to have one of those. But I had no money. Didn't own a car, nothing like that. So I said, well, I can always design something. I designed a video game. Now I'll just put the dots on a TV screen that spell out characters so I can read the characters and type. And I, that's, I designed a video terminal. Steve Jobs came along for the second time in my life. He said, let's sell this design. The first one was the blue box. And so we started selling those terminals. Then a, a computer club started, and the computer club was a bunch of people. Some of them had social revolutionary interests and in how computer technology could evolve and modify that, and we all were technical people. We were all grown up wanting computers of our own. I told my dad when I was in high school, I said, I'm going to have a 4K Nova someday. And he said, it costs as much as a house. I said, I'll live in an apartment. I was going to have a computer. Somehow, someday, well, I joined this club, and I hadn't realized micro microprocessors were. I saw the very first ones, and uh, they couldn't be used for anything that I called a computer. But the microprocessors had evolved, and now they sold a big rectangular computer kit that looked like it belonged in a rack on a factory floor. It looked like an airplane cockpit with all these switches and lights called the Altair. And it was not a computer. It claimed to be a computer. It was a microprocessor, a glorified microprocessor that if you plugged enough boards in of RAM and other stuff, you could make it into a computer that could run a program. But to me, a computer is a complete thing that you sit down on a keyboard and you start typing something in and what you type results in what comes out. You type, into a, you type a program in and it runs a program and does some task for you. That's a computer. It's not just having the starting block. It's not the cream soda computer I'd built five years before. And I said, look, I work at Hewlett Packard. Our, our calculators are actually little computers. We have a little processor on two chips, and it sits there saying what key is being pressed. And if you press the five button on the calculator, the program says, aha, a key got pressed. Aha, it's the five key. It puts a five in the display, and then it says what key is being pressed. And if you press the plus sign, it adds some numbers together. So I said, why don't I just write a little program and have a human keyboard? I've already got the human keyboard in my terminal. I just write a little program, and it goes in. It reads from this human keyboard, and you don't need any of the switches and lights as long as the keyboard is allowed with my program to do the same things. 
So now I, I stepped computers um, with the Apple One. Um, there still wasn't any idea to start a company. There was just, I was going to show off whatever my computer prowess, how I could design things with very few chips, and go down to the Homebrew Computer Club, and I passed out schematics of this. I passed out the listings, just freely. Anyone. I went over to some houses and helped people hand wire their own, this product that was going to become the Apple One. And every computer before the Apple One had one of those airplane cockpit, scary, geeky front panels. Every computer since the Apple One has come with a keyboard. So that was like a changing point in history, even though the Apple One wasn't the computer that really turned the world around. Steve Jobs came and he said, look, there's a whole bunch of people in this club that cl 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 clamor around you when you're doing your demonstrations. And they want this computer, but it's so hard for them. They can get the parts easy, but it's hard for them to wire it up. They just aren't solderers. So why don't we make a PC board? They can put their chips in the PC board and they can solder those on and they don't have to connect any wires and they're done. And we'll make the PC boards for 20 bucks, we'll sell them for 40 bucks. And, you know, it was going to cost us a thousand bucks in, and we'd have to sell 50 of them to make a profit. And I wasn't sure we'd sell 50 of them at the club. I mean, I had a gathering around me, but it wasn't, you know, I didn't know 50 people would buy it for 40 bucks. And Steve said, well, maybe we'll lose our money, but we can say we had a company for once. You know, and we were best friends, so we started the company, and it was later that Steve thought up the name Apple, which, you know, once you hear it, you can't. So he can't film up with anything better. How did he think of that name? Um, I, he worked in orchards up in Oregon, and I think there were apple trees in the orchards, but I never asked because I don't ask. And Steve never tells because he doesn't tell when he gets <laughs> ideas. Where his ideas have seeded from? He doesn't really give you that background of how it all adds together. So, um, so I'm just guessing. Just guessing. It's the yeah, apple, apple, <laughs> apple trees. I mean, <laughs> it could have been drug orchards. I don't know. <laughs> Steve... Yeah, Steve and I, personality-wise, he was kind of like the hippie, and he'd dress in his sandals and go off to India and all that stuff. And me, I had to be middle of the ground, middle of the road, you know. The way I, my father talked to me about how he was, that's how I wanted to be and have my feet on the ground. So, you know, I never did any of those hippie things. So how did you... How did you never, and, and, never once illicit drugs, nothing, ever. <laughs> but I, I, had a, I had a free mind. I had a free mind, and I would listen to everyone, hang around them, and, and you, know, you know, appreciate them as people, for, even if they were different.